This is Corey with Black Box Hobby, and thank you for choosing to listen to the Vintage Baseball Card Podcast, where everything old is new again. Today we're going to be discussing the 1909-1911 American Tobacco Company White Border Set, more commonly and affectionately known as T206. If you end up liking this episode and would like to show some support while also showing your love for the hobby, please visit our store at tpublic.com to see our baseball card themed shirts, hoodies, masks, magnets, and more. I'll have a link in the show notes, but the URL is tpublic.com slash user slash blackboxhobby. And you can also follow us on Twitter at blackboxhobby. And now on to the T206. It is doubtful that any single baseball card set in history has been more researched, more discussed, and more debated about than the T206 set. And for good reason. It is a set filled with beauty, nostalgia, even though no collector today was likely born when these cards were issued, lore, and most of all, desire, given it has what most would consider the holy grail of all baseball cards. To understand the passion many collectors have for the T206 cards, we must first take a step back in time. What was the greatest baseball season of all time? Baseball historians and common fans alike all have an opinion. Some would argue 1991, when the Braves and Twins both go from worst to first and stretch the World Series to the 10th inning of Game 7 in a pitcher's duel for all ages, with Jack Morris's Twins ultimately topping John Smoltz's Braves. Ricky Henderson also breaks the all-time steals record, Nolan Ryan throws his 7th no-hitter, and Cal Ripken solidifies his Hall of Fame credentials with one of the all-time great seasons for a shortstop. Those who can disregard the rampant PED usage of the era might say 1998 is the best season ever. With Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire chasing down Roger Maris's single-season home run record, Kerry Woods striking out 20 in a game, A-Rod joining the 40-40 club, and then of course the Yankees winning the World Series. Still, others may say that 1941 was the best season ever. Ted Williams hits 406 on the season, boldly going 6 for 8 in a doubleheader on the final day of the season to secure the feat. Joe DiMaggio goes on a 56 game hitting streak. Lefty Grove collects his 300th win, and the season is capped with an all New York World Series where the Yankees defeat the Brooklyn Dodgers. But many baseball historians would argue that the best baseball season of all time is 1908 the year baseball's undisputed position as the national pastime arguably took foothold. In the American League, a half game separated three teams going into the final day of the season. The Detroit Tigers, led by the Georgia Peach himself, Ty Cobb, would beat the Chicago White Sox that final day of the regular season to take the pennant by half a game. In the National League, the race was somehow even closer than the American League, With 11 games left in the regular season, the New York Giants played the Chicago Cubs at the Polo Grounds. The game was tied 1-1 in the bottom of the ninth thanks to wonderful pitching by Christy Mathewson and Jack Feister. With the Giants batting with two outs in the inning, pinch hitter Moose McCormick singles. 19-year-old rookie first baseman Fred Merkel was making the first start of his career as Fred Tenney the normal starting first baseman for the Giants was having back pain. With McCormick on first, Merkel lined a single to right field, and McCormick advanced to third. With men on first and third and two outs, Giants shortstop Al Bridwell lines the first offering from Feister up the middle into center field. McCormick scored, giving the Giants a 2-1 to one win, seemingly. As the home fans poured onto the field to celebrate the late season victory, Cubs second baseman Johnny Evers, the same Evers from the famous Tinker to Evers to Chance poem, noticed Merkel never touched second base, which would keep the force out in play and would void the run based on MLB rule 4.09. In the excitement of the win, Merkel, who was on first base, instead of running to second, made a dash for the clubhouse without first advancing to second to avoid the mob of fans advancing to the field. Evers directed Cubs center fielder Solly Hoffman to throw him the ball, 
As this is happening, Giants pitcher Joe McGinnity understood what Evers was up to, so he rushed over and grabbed the ball from Evers and threw it into the stands. How Evers got the ball back amidst the ensuing chaos is not clear. Some accounts propose that he or another Cubs player climbed into the stands and wrestled the ball back from the fan who caught it. Other accounts say Evers just picked up another available ball. Regardless, Evers stood with the ball on second and called umpire Bob Emsley over to contest the win, arguing that Merkel never touched the base. Emsley, who was the field umpire, had dove out of the way of the presumed game-winning line drive and as a result of the dive had failed to see whether Merkel actually touched second. So he appealed to home plate umpire Hank O'Day. O'Day, in a decision that would alter the course of baseball history, confirmed that Merkel had not touched the base and was therefore out. The game was ruled a tie, one to one. The Giants, upon hearing about the O'Day decision while they were already in the clubhouse, assumed it was a joke. Upon learning it was no joke, Giants manager John McGraw was outraged. National League president Harry Pullum later upheld the call. McGraw and the Giants appealed to the league's board of directors. After several days, the board came back with its final decision. Merkel was out. The game was a tie one-to-one. Sports writers referred to Merkel as a, quote, bonehead, and fans booed him whenever he took the field. The base running error forever came to be known as Merkel's boner. Merkel was personally devastated, blaming himself for the tie and later wishing he had simply made the third out of the inning while he was at bat to advance to extra innings. Of course, as fate would have it, likely with the intervention from the baseball gods, at the end of the regular season, the Giants and Cubs were tied for the pennant, which, assuming the remaining ten games of the season after Merkel's boner would have played out the same way regardless of the Merkel's boner controversy, meant that the base-running error by the eager 19-year-old rookie cost the Giants the clear pennant victory and instead were forced to play a one-game playoff with the Cubs. However, notably, the Giants could have chosen a best-of-five series with the Cubs, but with ailing players and a worn-out pitching staff, opted for the one-game, winner-take-all playoff game. In the one-game playoff, Cubs ace Mordecai Three-Finger Brown bested Christy Mathewson, the Christian gentleman, 4-2, with the Cubs moving on to win the World Series four games to one over Ty Cobb's Tigers. Perhaps with Evers using up a century of baseball luck in pursuing the Merkel's Boner call reversal, this would be the last World Series victory for the Cubs until 2016, a 108-year drought. The excitement generated by the two pennant races of 1908 sent baseball's popularity skyrocketing. With the American tobacco executives researching ways to increase the sale of tobacco products upon the conclusion of the exciting 1908 season, it's not surprising they would decide to incorporate the popularity of the new national pastime into their product. It was the birth of the T206 set, which would prove to be perhaps the most epic baseball card set of all time and would leave an everlasting mark to the hobby of card collecting. The T-206 name came from the numbering system developed by Jefferson Burdick, who we discussed in our very first episode for the American Card Catalog. The first known reference to the designation appeared in a magazine article written by Burdick in 1936 and later officially cataloged in Burdick's United States Card Collector's Catalog, published a few years later in 1939, which would eventually become the American Card Catalog. As we discussed in our very first episode where we talked about Burdick's influence on the hobby, the T in the T206 designation indicated that this was a 20th century United States tobacco card issue. The 206 came from the sequential numbering system that Burdick used. The size of the cards are 1 and 7 sixteenths inch by 2 and 5 eighths inches, However, as a result of the cutting and production process from that era, cards may vary slightly, 
and unscrupulous trimmers and card alterers are aware of the size variance and often take advantage in order to get a higher grade by unaware card graders. Cards with the American Beauty brand backing actually have a thinner width than the other typical T206 cards due to the thinner width of this brand's cigarette packs, which give them a unique quality among the T206 set. Total number of cards comprising the set changes fairly frequently as new variations are occasionally found. When factoring in the fronts and backs of the cards, there are over 7,000 unique cards in the set. There are 524 different fronts, 527 if you count three variations that were caused by a breakdown in the printing process. Because of the vast number of cards and variations, notable T206 collector and researcher and author Bill Heitman dubbed the set the Monster, and the nickname stuck. There are 16 different brand backings, which are American Beauty, Broadleaf, Carolina Brights, Cycle, Drum, El Principe de Galas, Hindu, Linux, Old Mill, Piedmont, Polar Bear, Sovereign, Sweet Caporal, Tolstoy, Uzit, and then the Thai Cobb brand, which we'll talk more about. The images for the set were produced by the American Lithograph Company. Many of the T206 portrait poses were based on the original photography of Bostonian Carl Horner. Horner, along with Charles Conlon, were two of the most prominent baseball photographers from the early 20th century. It appears that Horner gave permission to the American Tobacco Company to use his photographs on their cards. Perhaps the most valuable and most famous baseball card of all time, the T206 Onus Wagner, started out as a portrait photograph by Carl Horner. While we know the artistic renderings were based on the original photography of Horner and other photographers, my research couldn't find much info on the actual artists who so beautifully adapted these photographs. The cards were issued in three different series. These issuances are referred to as the 150, 350, and 460 series, with the designation being listed on the back of the card for most of the cigarette brands. How do card historians know the set originated in 1909? Probably the best piece of evidence that supports 1909 as the initial year of the set is a letter written to Neil Ball, infielder for the New York Highlanders, who would change their name to the Yankees in 1913. In this January 29, 1909 letter typed on the Greater New York Baseball Club letterhead, which had been another common name for the team that would eventually become the Yankees, Evening World sports writer Bozeman Bulger requests permission from Ball to include his picture in the set. The letter, which says that Bulger is, quote, getting up a scheme with the American Lithograph Company, end quote, gives much credence to the theory that the tobacco company or the lithograph company worked with sports writers in the city of the baseball clubs to obtain the permission of the ball players to appear in the set. There are several things I find interesting about this letter besides the fact that it sets 1909 as the likely date for the initial run of the set. Number one, I find it funny that Bulger uses the word scheme in reference to the baseball card idea an indicator that the word scheme, at least from a business perspective, has evolved into a more negative connotation in today's age. Number two, the newspaper sports writer Bozeman Bolger wrote this letter on ball club stationery, a practice that would never happen in today's age and perhaps an indicator of how tightly connected and cozy the sports writers were to the clubs they were covering, and possibly a mutual agreement to help grow the popularity of the sport through its coverage in the local papers. And number three, it provides indisputable evidence that the players did indeed have to give permission in order to be included in the set, giving credence to the theory and lore behind the rarity of the Onus Wagner card. Once players' permission was obtained and production started, the cards were then distributed in packs of participating cigarette brands regionally starting with the 150 series, with large major league cities such as New York, Chicago, and Boston being the test market for the initial run. As the tobacco manufacturer determined the 150 series to be a success, 
It follows shortly after with 350 series, which introduced Southern League and other minor league players with the cities of those teams being added to the distribution area. The cards were manufactured in six T206 factories which operated across four states, two in Virginia, two in New York, one in Ohio, and one in North Carolina, although in reality there were two in North Carolina, with one only producing a single version of a card, which we'll discuss later. Based on known cigarette production numbers from the time, some researchers speculate there could be as many as 370 million T206 cards produced. Some contend that figure is too high, but regardless of the exact number, these cards were undoubtedly mass-produced, with only a very, very small percentage of that overall production actually being saved by collectors of the era. Many of the cards were likely tossed away without even a viewing by the smokers of the day who cared not for the novelty card inserted into their pack of smokes. While that would seem outrageous to collectors today, these cards had virtually no economic value at the time, and with the sheer volume produced, one can surmise that the only reason many of the remaining specimens have substantial value today is because of the fact that these items were not highly sought after at the time, leaving most to simply be discarded. Through statistical extrapolations, one study suggests that about 1.6 million T206 cards remain in existence today. There is evidence from many miscut T206 specimens that the cards were typically, but not necessarily always, produced in sheets with the same subject running vertically and different subjects running horizontally. So the first column might be the same image of Christy Mathewson, the next column might be the same image of Walter Johnson, and so on. In my online research, I actually saw a prime example of this with a miscut Cy Young, where it was clear the same Cy Young card was in a vertical column on the sheet. The thick cardstock on which the T206 cards were printed has undoubtedly contributed to their sturdiness and survival over the last 110 plus years. There is evidence that supports, at least in some pack brands, that more than one card was included in each pack of cigarettes. Card collector John Wagner, who most notably sold one of his duplicate Onus Wagner cards to Jefferson Burdick, stated in a 1990 interview that he collected the T206 set as a kid and indicated that each cigarette pack usually had two cards and that occasionally he would find three or four. Also, an ad for Hindu cigarettes from 1909 states, quote, free, two pictures of celebrated baseball players in every box. One aspect of collecting the T206 is that there are, well, options on how you want to collect. What can be an expensive endeavor for most, whichever way you choose to collect, a conventional method is to collect as many of the 524 subjects, or the front images, as possible. Others may prefer to focus on acquiring as many as possible of the various backs, which again feature various tobacco brands. Others may desire to collect only cards of a particular back. Some may choose to only collect the portrait style cards. Some collect specific leagues featured in the set, such as the Southern League. Not only does the set itself seem limitless with over 7,000 known variations, the numbers of ways a collector can choose to attack the monster also seems to have no end. And why do hobbyists continue to pine over the T206 set? There are really several factors to consider. One, the undeniable beauty of the T206. I purchased a complete reprint set of the T206 several months ago. After seeing a tweet by at SaberBBCards showing a video of someone who had arranged the set in a binder by using the color of the backgrounds and basically going from morning to night, I did the same thing. And I have to admit, it is a sight to behold just to flip through the album when they are arranged in this format. Many of the cards feature beautiful backgrounds with the community even creating a subset called the Sunset Subset due to the pinks, oranges, and reds so beautifully depicted on some of the cards. There are intimate close-up portraits, action shots, and simple poses alike, all of which have a rather simple, timeless look. The undeniable beauty and eye appeal of these artistic renderings will likely forever be appreciated by card collectors. Number two, 
Like many pre-war issues, the small size of the cards, as compared to the traditional uniform card size we know today, adds a bit of novelty to an already desirable set. Number three, mystery and lore. There are so many unanswered questions when it comes to the T206. What's the truth behind the Wagner scarcity? Perhaps even more intriguing, the Plank scarcity. How were the Cobb Cobbs actually distributed, and why do they only show up in Georgia? The fact that these questions can likely never be answered gives hobbyists room for debate and adds to the intrigue and allure of the set. Number four, Americana. These cards represent the early days of the sport that is uniquely American. They are also a callback to a simpler time, a time when there were no PED issues, no strikes, no obscenely large contracts. Number five, options. As I discussed earlier, collectors have so many options on how to collect. Perhaps they want a specific player featuring different backs, an early rainbow of sorts. Or perhaps they want to collect only Piedmont backs. Or perhaps the sunset subset I mentioned earlier. Collectors can have fun with how they choose to collect. And number six, given the fact that the Holy Grail card, the most expensive card in the hobby, is part of this set, it by default brings attention and desirability to the other cards of the set. The average collector could never afford the Wagner, but can easily afford a common, or with a little splurging, can even attain a Hall of Famer at an affordable price, especially when compared to the cost of today's wax. Speaking of Hall of Famers, there are 38 Hall of Famers in the set, many with multiple front poses. The full list of Hall of Famers are Home Run Baker, Jack Beckley, Chief Bender, Roger Bresnahan, Mordecai Brown, Frank Chance, Jack Chesbro, Fred Clark, Ty Cobb, Eddie Collins, Jimmy Collins, Sam Crawford, George Davis, Hugh Duffy, Johnny Evers, Elmer Flick, Clark Griffith, Miller Huggins, Hugh Jennings, Walter Johnson, Addie Joss, Wee Willie Keeler, Joe Kelly, Nat Lajaway, Rube Marcard, Christy Mathewson, Joe McGinnity, John McGraw, Eddie Plank, Tris Speaker, Joe Tinker, Rube Waddell, Onus Wagner, Bobby Wallace, Ed Walsh, Zach Wheat, Vic Willis, and Cy Young. Now let's talk about what's known as the Big Four. First up is Joe Doyle. Doyle has a variation which is proven to be very rare, and due to the prestige and lore of this set, very expensive. Slow Joe Doyle played for the New York Highlanders, an American League team from 1906 to 1910. Because both the Highlanders of the American League and the Giants of the National League were both New York teams, and only the team's city name is listed on the front of the cards and not the nickname, the manufacturers included a league designation, American or National, for these New York player cards. It is believed that in an early production run, Doyle's card was depicted with the designation of the National League, which was specifically N-A-T apostrophe L. One possible theory is that he was mistaken for Larry Doyle, who played for the New York Giants of the National League at the time. The error was seemingly identified rather early in the production process, and the National League designation was simply removed, not even replaced by the American League designation, just simply removed. This variation, or what I'd rather call an error card, was first discovered in 1981 by card dealer Larry Frisch. Frisch had found the card and, confused by its existence, placed several ads in hobby magazines looking to purchase additional copies of the error card. It wasn't until 1987 that another of the Doyle error cards came to light and was eventually sold for $10,000 to Fritch, who clearly understood the rarity of the card. The number of known examples of the Doyle National Error Card can be counted on two hands, and this seems to be the rarest card in the T206 set even rarer than the Onus Wagner card. Due to the extreme rarity, Joe Doyle, the right-handed pitcher with a pedestrian career record of 22 wins and 21 losses, has his baseball card near the top of the all-time most valuable cards. Next up is the Sherry Meiji variation, or like the Doyle, what I'll call an error card. 
Sherry Magee, spelled M-A-G-E-E, -E, was an outfielder with the Philadelphia Phillies. The Magee error card, which is substantially more rare and valuable than the corrected card, is simply a misspelling of Sherry Magee's name on the portrait version of his card. His name was spelled M-A-G-I-E instead of the correct spelling, which has two E's at the end. This error is only found with a Piedmont 150 back. Like the Doyle error, the error was caught early in the production process and corrected, thus creating a rarity of the error card. Add to the fact that Mage's career numbers, 59.4 war, 291 average, 2,169 hits, and 441 stolen bases, are borderline Hall of Fame worthy, Meiji's error card is an expensive elite card in the hobby. Next up is the Hall of Famer Eddie Plank. The rarity of Plank's portrait T206, which is the only version of card he has in the T206 set, is a confusing mystery. While the rarity of the Doyle and Meiji error cards can be explained due to their early corrections in the printing process, there is no known explanation for the extreme rarity of the Plank card. We are left to only speculate. One such speculation was that the printing plate simply broke early on in the production process. However, the Plank card is found both in the 150 and the 350 series, which would seem to discount if not disprove that theory. Is it possible he didn't want to promote smoking, especially to children? Is it possible that he didn't give the manufacturers permission to use his likeness and they were forced to remove his cards from production? Is it possible his cards were simply a short print due to the printing method at the time? It's a mystery that outside of a smoking gun letter being found will never be solved. The card is found primarily with a sweet corporal back, but also found in even fewer quantities with a Piedmont back. And given that he is found in both the 150 and 350 series leaves further confusion as to why he is found in such limited quantities. In a way, the mystery adds to the mystique and desire of the card. And now, the holy grail, the T206 Onus Wagner. No other card may be as well known among non-hobbyists as the Wagner T206. It has successfully crossed over into popular culture and the national zeitgeist as the pinnacle, the holy grail of the hobby that is baseball card collecting. Add to the extreme rarity of the card the fact that Wagner is probably the second best player featured in the set, with most agreeing Cobb's numbers would put him over Wagner, and that his lifetime numbers place him squarely as one of the game's all-time greats, it's no wonder that this card has become a symbol for the hobby and an unattainable piece of cardboard due to its skyrocketing value. I can't tell you where or how I first learned of the T206 Wagner, but I can say definitively that as a 10-year-old kid in 1990, I somehow knew then of the lore behind the Wagner and its place as the most valuable card in our hobby. At some point around that time, my parents bought me some perforated reprints of several vintage sets, not the entire sets, but just a few key cards from several sets. And of course, the reprint Wagner was key among the reprint samples that I had. So why is it so rare? One belief is that Wagner demanded the tobacco company stop producing his card because he did not want to encourage kids to smoke. However, Wagner was well known for his love of chewing tobacco, particularly in his later years, which adds some doubt to this theory. However, one could still be against promoting children from smoking while you yourself participate in chewing tobacco as an adult. In fact, this theory is supported by an October 22, 1914 article in the San Jose Mercury News where Wagner's Pirates teammate and roommate, Irv Cantliner, is quoted as saying, Wagner's only bad habit is his love of chewing tobacco but he detests cigarettes and does not smoke in any form. I have seen him refuse several checks of $1,000 by cigarette companies who want to use his name. Others believe that perhaps ahead of his time, Wagner simply wanted to be properly compensated for the use of his likeness. The tradition of simply getting permission from players or compensating them very little, such as a state dinner, is something that would go on for decades to come and arguably perfected by Topps in its early days. 
but players today know their image, their likeness, has value. And the MLBPA has obviously helped ensure players today get properly compensated by card companies. But without a union in the relative early days of baseball, Wagner could have just seen the eventual writing on the wall that ball players should be properly compensated when their images were used. The best and strongest evidence we have is an article from the October 24, 1912 edition of the Sporting News, which discusses Wagner's refusal to be included in the set. The article states that when Wagner's permission was requested for inclusion in the set, the Pirate Hall of Famer actually sent a check for $10 to John Gruber, the Pittsburgh sports writer who had been contracted by the American Tobacco Company to get Wagner's and other Pirate players' permission to be included. If the article is to be believed, Wagner did this because he did not want to feel guilty for costing the sports writer the money he could have earned for getting Wagner's signature on the dotted line. Wagner wrote that he, quote, did not care to have his picture in a package of cigarettes, end quote. He threatened to seek legal action against the American Tobacco Company if they went ahead and distributed his baseball card. However, I would note that writing that he, quote, did not care to have his picture in a package of cigarettes, end quote, is not the same as refusing to be included because they are cigarettes. Wagner had been previously included on tobacco card and advertisements and had a history of being a tough negotiator. However, if his objection was over compensation, why would he take money out of his own pocket to compensate the sports writer? I do believe one of the theories are true. Either he didn't want to be included because it was a cigarette product and he didn't want to encourage children to smoke, or he simply wanted to be more fairly compensated for his likeness and therefore refused to be included in the set. Both theories have support and flaws, and the unanswered question and lore behind the possible reason only adds to the mystique of this rare and most highly desirable card in the hobby. It is estimated that around 100 Wagner cards are in existence. The card has only been found with Piedmont and Sweet Caporal backing. The Piedmont backing is extremely rare with only a few in existence. Only a handful of the Wagner cards are in crease-free condition. One of the best condition Wagners sold in 1991 for the then unprecedented sum of $451,000. If the obscene amount of the sale wasn't enough to pique the public's interest in the card, when you add the fact that the new owner was none other than the great one, Wayne Gretzky, along with Bruce McNall, owner of the Los Angeles Kings, who would later be convicted of swindling banks out of $236 million, the T206 Wagner officially jumped into the national consciousness as the Holy Grail baseball card. This specific card would hence be known as the Gretzky Wagner. In 2013, a former owner of the card and well-known card auctioneer Bill Mastro admitted under oath that the Gretzky Wagner, which had been graded a PSA 8, had indeed been trimmed by Mastro himself, as many had believed. The card has changed hands many times since the Gretzky purchase, but the current owner paid the whopping sum of $2.35 million in 2007 and was later revealed to be Arizona Diamondbacks owner Ken Kendrick. Given the fact that the Gretzky Wagner PSA 8 card was proven to be trimmed and altered, a PSA 5 version known as the Jumbo Wagner, due to the fact that it was miscut, leaving a wider bottom border, is now widely believed to be the finest unaltered example of the T206 Wagner, and sold in October 2016 for the record-setting sum of $3.12 million. Some argue the last card we are going to talk about isn't a true T206 card. However, most collectors and hobbyists agree that it is, we're talking about the Ty Cobb with a Ty Cobb back, commonly referred to as the Cobb Cobb, referencing Cobb as the player on the front and the brand on the back. And yes, that means there was a tobacco brand using the name and likeness of Ty Cobb. The brand was a subsidiary of the American Tobacco Company. And while Cobb has many front image variations, the only front image that exists on the Cobb backed cards is the red background portrait-style Cobb. 
This variation is revered as one of the most desirable of all baseball cards, obviously due to the combination of its rarity combined with the subject of the card, Ty Cobb, who is one of the all-time best and most controversial players of all time. There are only about 22 known examples of the card, with seven of those being found together in 2016 and became known as the Lucky Seven Find, with the designation even being printed on the PSA labels. The typical T206 card has a matte finish on the front, but the Cobb Cobb actually has a glossy front finish. While the T206 cards were manufactured in various factories, it is known that the Cobb Cobb was manufactured in a distinct factory in North Carolina where no other T206 cards were produced. How the cards were distributed is a matter up for debate among researchers, with some believing the cards were handed out at the point of sale. But given that many of the known cards do have tobacco stains, there is stronger evidence that at least some were included in the tobacco product, possibly in the Ty Cobb granulated cut plug product, which was sold in a rather ornate, slim tin can, which is actually very beautiful and a rare collectible in its own right. The overwhelming majority, if not all, of the Cobb Cobb cards have been discovered in Georgia. Cobb, being from Georgia and nicknamed the Georgia Peach, was a famous native son, and it is speculated that the cards were only distributed in products in that state. There are other variations in the set that have similar rarity to the cards we've discussed, such as the Fred Snodgrass card missing the S, Fred Nodgrass, the Bud Sharp with his last name misspelled as Shap, and the polar bear Bill O'Hara. These cards also hold significant premiums, but the five we have discussed seem to be the most valuable and sought after by the hobby community. With each set discussion, I choose five cards to highlight. These aren't necessarily the most expensive or desirable cards, as I actually just discussed those five cards which are virtually unattainable by most of us. These are just simply five other cards that I find interesting and compelling as a collector. Number five on that list is Mordecai Brown. As a Cubs fan, this set offers many to choose from. You obviously can't go wrong with Tinker or Evers or Chance, and obtaining all three for a Tinker to Evers to Chance display would be the ultimate conversation piece. However, I'm choosing a pitcher and focusing on Mordecai Brown, more commonly known as Three Finger Brown. Due to a farming accident in his youth, Brown lost parts of two fingers on his throwing hand and further damaged the hand when he fell during recovery. This unfortunate occurrence gave him the rather colorful nickname of Three Finger. The disability ironically gave Brown the opportunity to learn how to uniquely grip a baseball that resulted in one of the best curves, or knuckle curves, in the game, and he became one of the best pitchers of his era, ultimately being elected into the Hall of Fame posthumously. He won two World Series with his time with the Cubs, including the 1908 series we discussed earlier, where he played a pivotal role in the one-game playoff. Mordecai Brown has three poses in the T206 set, really two poses with one having a variation on the uniform. The card I'm choosing to focus on is the one dubbed Chicago on Shirt. In this card, Brown is featured from the waist up. The image is set against a yellow stained sky where it appears the sun is hidden directly behind Brown's head based on the brightness of the yellow around his head as the sky gradually becomes a darker shade of yellow as the card expands. Brown, with ruffled, disheveled hair in direct contrast to some of the other very dapper styles we'll discuss, has his glove just coming into view of the card on his left hand while his right arm has clearly just thrown the ball and is nearing full follow-through. The dark gray uniform is adorned with a black collar and singular black stripe up the middle where the buttons might be. Chicago is spelled vertically in white along the black stripe, while the traditional Cubs logo, a large C with UBS on the inside of the C, rests on the left breast of his uniform. Again, this card appeals to me as a Cubs fan, with Brown still ranking near the top of all Cubs pitchers. This card can be obtained in lesser conditions in the $1 to $200 range. Number four on my list is Sam Crawford. 
I became a fan of Sam Crawford after reading Lawrence Ritter's classic book, The Glory of Their Times, where he gets first-hand accounts and stories of baseball's early days by tracking down many of the game's early players and documenting their accounts. The way Ritter finds Crawford is an amusing tale, and he is portrayed as a reclusive, humble man and a voracious reader, although his purported jealousy of Ty Cobb might contradict with this portrayal. For any fan of vintage cards, I would highly recommend this book. Crawford, also known as Wahoo Sam due to his hometown of Wahoo, Nebraska, played much of his career for Detroit in the shadow of the Georgia Peach, and the two developed a clear rivalry that would last beyond baseball. His 309 career triples remains the all-time record as he hit more triples than doubles an amazing four times in his career. He has two poses in the T206 set, one throwing and one batting. The card that I'm focusing on today is his throwing card as I think it has more eye appeal. The card features the right-handed outfielder throwing the ball on the right side of the card while the left side of the card highlights beautiful colors of the background that are present in so many of the T206 cards. Crawford is shown throwing the ball with the distinct letter D, the Detroit logo, featured prominently on his cap. A gray uniform accented with a black belt and a black popped collar contrasts nicely against the bright green grass and the blues, pinks, yellows, and oranges of the sky, which are featured prominently on the left side of the card. This is a prime example of the simplistic beauty of many of the T206 cards. Again, I'm called to this card after reading about Crawford in Ritter's book. Like the Mordecai Brown card, this card can be obtained in lesser conditions for $1 to $200. Number 3. Rube Waddell I was first educated about Rube Waddell by watching the Ken Burns baseball documentary. One of the most eccentric personalities to ever play the game, this southpaw pitcher would go on to be elected to Cooperstown in 1946, some 32 years after his death in 1914 at the untimely age of 37. A likely alcoholic who, many speculate, may have had some mental disorders that contributed to his often strange behaviors, his short life was filled with highs and lows. Rube has two different poses in the T206 set, one being the Carl Horner portrait style, but the one I prefer is the throwing image where he's mid-follow through after throwing the ball. Playing for the St. Louis Browns of the American League at the time, he is displayed with the ST and L for St. Louis across the chest of his gray uniform in brown lettering. The collar of his shirt and cap are the same rich brown color, almost bordering on maroon to the naked eye. His red lips with the hint of a smile add a pop of color to his otherwise pale, almost ghostish face. Bright green grass covers the lower half of the card background, while a mixture of purple, orange, yellow, and blue make up the sky, which covers the upper half of the background. The wrinkles of the uniform give the tiny piece of art a realistic feel. Depending on your personal sensitivity to card condition, this card can be obtained in lower conditions for around $175 to $200. Number 2. Addy Joss The Addy Joss similarities to Rube Waddell are undeniable. While Waddell was a heavy drinker, Joss remained sober throughout his life, largely attributable to the fact that his father had died a young man due to liver disease likely brought on by drinking. Like Waddell, Joss died prematurely at the young age of 31 due to contracting tuberculosis meningitis. And like Waddell, he was posthumously elected to the Hall of Fame. After Joss's death, the first All-Star game of sorts was played as a fundraiser for the benefit of Joss's family as stars from the game volunteered to participate in the game for the well-liked Joss. The likes of Home Run Baker, Ty Cobb, Eddie Collins, Sam Crawford, Walter Johnson, and Tris Speaker all participated in the game, which raised $13,000, which is equivalent to $357,000 today. While his career numbers aren't eye-popping due to his short career, his individual seasons are some of the best of all time, and like Waddell, he has two poses in the T206, a Horner portrait pose and a pitching pose. The card that appeals more to me in this case is the more intimate portrait pose. In the card, the background is a solid, deep, mustard yellow. Joss is shown from the chest up, staring some 45 degrees into the distance. 
the collar on his dark gray uniform is popped up, hiding his neck, while Cleveland is displayed across his chest in black. Joss's hair is split down the middle in what appears to be a common style of the time, with somewhat wavy bangs slightly hanging over the left and right sides of his forehead in a very dapper manner. His rosy cheeks give him the persona that he is full of life, and perhaps the irony of this, contrasted against his death just a few years later, is perhaps why this card appeals to me. And again, depending on how sensitive you are to condition, this card can be obtained in the $100 to $200 range in lesser conditions. And number one on the list is Cy Young. The historic pitcher, whose 511 career wins will never be broken, has three different poses in the T206 set. The card that I'm choosing to highlight is the green portrait pose. Young's accomplishments on the field speak for themselves, so much so that MLB named its award for the best pitcher of the year after the hard-throwing right-handed pitcher. This card, which features Young, then with the Cleveland Naps, from the chest up staring at a 45-degree angle into the distance. Young, who may not be exactly overweight, but clearly a little pudgy in the twilight of his career, is shown with his hair very neatly combed with a split right down the middle, similar to Joss, but much less stylish. To me, he appears uncomfortable or out of sorts, a country farm boy being forced to clean up for the camera. With a solid green background, the city Cleveland is displayed in black across the chest of his collared gray uniform. I don't know what or why, but I capture sadness in this card. It could be the slightly downturned lips, or again, perhaps it's the awkwardness of the aging farm boy posing for a picture with his slickly combed hair. But there's something haunting in this card, at least for me. And I think that's part of the beauty of all these cards and art in general. Each person may get or feel something different. In conclusion, the T206 set has something for just about every collector. From rather affordable commons in the $25 to $40 range, to the ultra expensive and rare cards that can almost be a status symbol among the elite few hobbyists who can afford to chase those cards. The undeniable artistic beauty of these cards have stood the test of time and will continue to appeal to collectors for years to come. A quote-unquote scheme, as it was described in the letter we discussed earlier, put together by men trying to sell tobacco, which enlisted sports writers to obtain permission from ballplayers to use their images to be printed on thin cardboard in six different factories, which would then be inserted into 16 various brands of tobacco, all with early 20th century technology printing and distribution limitations, would seem to be an endeavor that was doomed for failure before it began. And while these businessmen's intentions were merely to sell more tobacco, something beautiful happened alongside that goal for those of us who, one, have the collecting gene, two, appreciate baseball history, and three, enjoy the beauty and art of these promotional inserts. Like the Allen and & Ginter and Old Judge products that came before, these cards became highly sought-after relics of a bygone era many decades later. If you ever hold one in your hand, you'll probably understand the magnetic pull and desire to own these cards. During the time of Presidents Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, and during the progressive era of U.S. history, the tobacco cards also progressed our hobby and would leave an everlasting impression. Perhaps the best way to end this podcast is with a quote from my favorite movie, Field of Dreams. I'll replace a few words, but the sentiment holds true. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been the T-206. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again. But the T-206 has marked the time. This card, this image... It's a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that was once good, and it could be again. Oh, people will collect, Ray. People will most definitely collect. And that officially wraps up our look at the monster, the much-beloved T206 set. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Vintage Baseball Card Podcast. I hope you'll stick around for the release of our next episode, where we take a look at the 1910-1911 Turkey Red set, 
or the T3 as designated by Jefferson Burdick. Again, if you like this podcast and would like to show some support while also showing your love for the hobby, please visit our store at tpublic.com to see our baseball card-themed shirts, hoodies, masks, magnets, and more. I'll have a link in the show notes. Until next time, remember, everything old is new again. Happy collecting.